The Bible commands us in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 to be able to give a reasonable defense of our faith. This episode will explain how there is biblical and scientific evidence for an ice age and why the evolutionary explanations for the ice age are incorrect. The typical evolutionary scenario involves a slow cooling of the Earth over time. However, this will not generate an ice age. If the oceans cooled along with the land at a gradual pace when the temperature on Earth was finally so cold that snow did not melt during summer, it would already be too late for evaporation from the oceans to produce enough snow to generate massive ice sheets. Under the evolutionary assumption, the Earth would turn into a frozen desert instead of experiencing an ice age. The Bible does contain references to the ice age. Early on in the book of Job, in Job chapter 6 verse 16, both ice and snow are mentioned. Towards the end of the book of Job, Elihu states that out of the south cometh the whirlwind, and cold out of the north. By the breath of God, frost is given, and the breath of the waters is straightened. In God's response to Job, he says, Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war, out of whose womb came the ice and the hoary frost of heaven. Who has gendered it? The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. These verses seem to indicate that Job perhaps lived in the dwindling years of the Ice Age, somewhere between the time of the Tower of Babel and the life of Abraham. The questions that Job was asked indicate that Job had first-hand, or at least historical knowledge, of the fact that there was an Ice Age. After the flood, the oceans were warmer because of the heated subterranean water and energy from volcanic activity. Extra heat would make more water vapor that would cool high in the sky and then fall as rain or snow. The warmer oceans would cause rain to fall near the equator and snow to fall in northern latitudes that build ice sheets atop the continents. Oxygen isotopes in the shells of miniature marine creatures like Formaminifera record this warming period prior to the Ice Age. The flood caused volcanic eruptions, which in turn released volcanic dust and aerosols. The volcanic dust and aerosols, which are tiny airborne particles, would have reflected solar radiation back into space, in turn causing temperatures over land to grow colder and cause summers to be cold, which would keep the ice from melting. The plesiostine sediments formed quickly after the flood reveal evidence of volcanic activity confirming the above statements. The warm ocean would trigger evaporation, and consistent evaporation near the ice sheets at the poles would have caused them to grow. The warm oceans and the cooling poles would have plunged the world into fierce atmospheric convection. Eventually, perhaps over a period of 500 years, the ice sheets melted.
As stated in the previous answer, tectonic activity led to the conditions necessary for the initiation of an ice age. Genesis chapter 7 verse 11 says that the deep fountains burst forth during the global Genesis flood. When these superheated fountains burst, they in turn raised the temperature of the global waters. Repeated volcanic eruptions ejected the aerosols and both rain and snowfall were increased. The disastrous effect of both the flood and the ice age are found in the geological evidence that indicates northern glacial activity and that places that are now desert were formerly tropical. The necessary preconditions for an ice age, heated oceans, and airborne aerosols are both explained by the flood and the catastrophic plate tectonics and volcanic activity that accompanied it. Scientists drill cylinders of ice from ice sheets, like in Greenland or Antarctica, and these are what are called ice cores. Ice cores can sometimes show signs of things like the stability of isotopes or dust fluctuation. Evolutionary scientists, assuming that annual weather patterns are what cause the fluctuations shown by ice cores, believe that because hundreds of thousands of such fluctuations exist, then the sheets of ice are hundreds of thousands of years old and thus fall out of the biblical timeline. The lower sections of ice cores have features that fluctuate, and so the inference is implausible because there is a spectrum of what is considered to be layers. Furthermore, Single snowstorms have been able to generate layers that mimic these annual fluctuations. There are several other facts that pertain to age estimation with respect to ice cores that will be discussed throughout this episode, showing that there is scientific support for the hypothesis that ice sheets formed several thousand years ago and not hundreds of thousands or millions of years ago. The idea that the ice cores, like those in Greenland, provide evidence for millions of years of time is based off of circular reasoning. After examining chemical changes in deep seafloor sediments, scientists look for indications of subtle changes in summer sunlight within the northern high latitudes. The changes in sunlight are said to result from what are called Milankovitch cycles, which are slow, periodic adjustments in both the orbital and rotational motion of the Earth. Based on the Milankovitch hypothesis, these cycles indicate that multiple ice ages have taken place within approximately the last 2.5 million years. Under the assumption that the Milankovitch hypothesis is accurate, scientists estimate ages for the cores of deep seafloor sediment. The now dated seafloor sediments are utilized to estimate ages for further sediment cores, including ice cores. Then the ice cores are used to date other sediment cores. This is circular reasoning. The hundreds of thousands of supposedly annual layers are actually too young for what old earth scientists expected. Scientists writing in the Journal of Glaciology were anticipating that the bottom of the second Greenland Ice Sheets Project's core would be more than 200,000 years in age. However, despite recounting the core's bottom part, only 110,000 of their expected annual layers were produced. There are some scientists who claim that perhaps these supposedly missing layers were swept along by laterally flowing ice. However, this could not be the case 
because the second Greenland Ice Sheets Project's ice cores were taken from locations where the thinning ice moves straight down. Melting is not a probable explanation because the bottom of the second Greenland Ice Sheets Project is below the pressure melting point. According to a study done by the University of Buffalo geologist Jason Briner, ice sheets can retreat in a geological instant. Glaciers demonstrated evidence of rapid meltback and, according to Jason Briner, exhibit rapid fluctuations in speed and position. Briner and his team of researchers studied rock samples from a jord that drained North American ice sheets. A jord is a long, narrow inlet with steep sides or cliffs created by a glacier. Briner said in a UB press release that the lion's share of the retreat occurred in a geological instant, probably within as little of a few hundred years. Rapid melting contradicts the evolutionary idea that proposes the last ice age experienced meltback anywhere from 20,000 and 5,000 years ago. Evolutionary glaciologists look at certain debris layering patterns as demonstrations of glacier melting and regrowth that occurred over thousands of years. In contrast, creation researchers have instead interpreted these same features as evidence of annual meltback episodes. If glaciers can melt rapidly, as shown by Briner's research, then the creationary explanation is more probable than the evolutionary explanation. In the year 2008, Penn State biochemists discovered bacteria in an ice core that had been drilled roughly three kilometers into a Greenland glacier. After incubating the bacteria, the biochemists were able to get the bacteria to grow. Evolutionary scientists would date the ice at that depth to about 120,000 years. Although the fact that these bacteria survived for so long does call into question the evolutionary timescale because of the fact that the conditions were frigid, preservation of the bacteria is theoretically possible. The fact that these bacteria had the specialization capability to cope with this extreme environment is a testament to the fact that they were front-loaded with design features. On April 18th of the year 2018, the Public Broadcasting Corporation aired a documentary called Bill Nye Science Guy. Though Bill Nye's documentary took a critical stance of young earth creation, the film actually highlighted evidence for a young earth. The documentary episode showcased deep ice cores from Greenland. In showing the ice cores, the documentary inadvertently demonstrated that evolutionary scientists are overestimating the number of annual layers in the Greenland ice cores. Before we see exactly how Bill Nye's documentary highlighted evidence for a young earth, we will look at what is called tephra. Tephra is the debris that is produced by explosive volcanic eruptions. A picture of tephra is in the article included in this video's description. To return to the point, tephra can fall as ash or fragments and has even fallen on ice sheets. Upon the extraction of said ice cores, scientists can see dark bands or markings within the ice core. This dark band within the cores is actually the layers of volcanic debris. Because explosive volcanic eruptions are short and catastrophic, the eruption's debris rapidly settles in the air. The height of the particles when ejected into the atmosphere, how far these particles were from the volcanoes, and their size and composition all affect the time of their fallout. For example, particles that are less than a micron in diameter, 
like stratospheric aerosols, have the ability to stay in the atmosphere for years. Ash particles that are larger usually have a lifespan of weeks or months. Herein lies a problem. If evolutionary scientists are overestimating the actual number of annual layers, they will designate extremely long periods of time, primarily those parts of the core that are the deepest part of the ice core. When that happens, despite the fact that the tephra represents a short and violent eruption and does not range for numerous years. With this idea in mind, we can examine what happened in the documentary Bill Nye Science Guy. At an hour, four minutes, and 53 seconds in, Bill Nye was speaking with a climatologist named Dr. James White. Dr. White and Mr. Nye were checking out a Greenland ice core section. Bill Nye points out a tephra and asks Dr. White if it represents an eruption. Dr. White continues to speak and eventually says that the ice core is approximately 27,000 years in age. Bill Nye then observes that the tephra layer is unbroken and so, in his mind, represented about 15 to 17 years. This calculation is assumedly based on the idea that the visible bands that are nearby in the ice represent yearly layers. So, Bill Nye's idea is that because the supposed tephra layer was roughly 15 to 17 times thicker than the supposedly annual layers that were nearby, the tephra that he was looking at should depict a time frame of about 15 to 17 years. Bill Nye appeared to be shocked at the idea that eruption fallout would have a duration upwards to two decades. Bill Nye's surprised reaction should not come as a surprise. There is no explosive volcanic eruption in recorded history that has ever lasted for more than a decade, let alone nearly close to two decades. Let us grant for a moment that the layer of tephra was laid down by various explosions from multiple volcanoes. Even if this was taken as a given, non-stop explosive volcanic activity that lasted close to two decades has never been observed. Bill Nye seemed to suggest that the tephra he was looking at was evidence for a protracted period of volcanism. However, it makes more sense to posit that perhaps evolutionary scientists are mistaking non-annual layers for annual ones. Even though the documentary, Bill Nye Science Guy, tried to discredit young earth creation, it unintentionally underscored evidence against the evolutionary eons. The Lost Squadron demonstrates the rapid accumulation of ice. The Lost Squadron was a group of six P-38 fighter planes and two B-17 bombers that crash-landed on the east side of Greenland in 1942. After a number of salvage attempts in the 1980s and 90s, they found the planes buried under 75 meters or 250 feet of ice. The impression the general public has is that the buildup of glacial ice takes very long time, periods thousands of years for just a few meters, but the average rate of accumulation would be one and a half meters or five feet per year. This demonstrates the invalidity of the assumption of uniformitarianism. There were a few reasons why the woolly mammoth went extinct. After disembarking on the Ark, catastrophic climate change and loss of habitat made it difficult for them to rebuild their numbers. However, all on board the Ark would have faced a difficult post-flood environment. So what happened to the woolly mammoths? The remaining woolly mammoth populations were likely hunted to extinction as mankind spread out across the world during and after the Ice Age. There are several indicators that render it likely that there was only one Ice Age after the Genesis Flood, and not multiple Ice Ages as predicted in the evolutionary model of Earth's history. 
the fact that requirements for an ice age to even occur at all are very inflexible signifies the likelihood of there being only one ice age. Furthermore, virtually every ice age sediment is from the last. Additionally, those deposits are thin over the interior areas and not thick at the periphery areas. Because till can occasionally be laid down rapidly, notably in end moraines, till's primary characteristics are indicative of there being one ice age. Also, the fact that plesiostene fossils are rare in glaciated areas strikes a bit odd if you were to consider there were many interglacials. Finally, the majority of megafaunal extinctions were after the last which is a hard fact to explain should multiple ice ages have to be accounted for. In our modern world, the patterns of weather are influenced by jet streams, which are massive high altitude air currents. Because weather patterns are controlled by ocean temperatures, Warmer oceans leads to an increase in evaporation, and thus an increase in precipitation. As stated, the breaking open of the fountains of the Great Deep was one of the driving forces of the Genesis Flood, and the excess heat in the oceans eventually led to a post-flood ice age. The tectonic nature of the flood was catastrophic, and because the continents were rising, the ocean basins were sinking, and this fractured the crust of the Earth. Weather post-flood was unstable, and earthquakes were frequent, which may be a reason why people in early recorded post-flood history dwelt in tents instead of building structures that were susceptible to collapse in event of an earthquake. This kind of unstableness likely continued until around the time of Abraham, the man whom the Apostle Paul says looked by faith to the Promised Land. I pray that you enjoyed this episode of Genesis Under a Microscope and that you will subscribe to Christ Jesus Ministries YouTube channel. For more faith building content, continue to watch the rest of the episodes in this series. See the description where you will also find a study guide on this video's topic and scientific articles that further explain the topic summarized in this video. Take note of the fact that we're heading towards the land of promise and remember. Truth saves.